it is, what it can do for you. A uh, bit of an outline here, um, give you a little introduction to what layout command control is and what it isn't, how it works, but I'm not going to get into the weeds so people don't have to worry about sitting a screen after screen of configuration files and so on. Um, what are the pieces that you need to make it work, integrating it into your layout, and then I'm going to actually show how do you actually configure a node. Um, sometimes it's the scary part. Uh, people think it's a little bit more complicated. Um, I hope to dispel that theory. Um, some simple examples, and then if we have time, I'll do some Q&A. And I also have a demo layout here. Uh, Mike, I can switch it over to a regular camera. Um, if we have time at the end, I can kind of walk through what the pieces look like on a little demonstration layout. I'll just give you some background on why I even got interested in layout command control. You know, I wanted to put together a system that um, had lights and signals and turnouts. Also for staging yards, I wanted a single push button to route into a certain track. Um, I understand that there are systems out there that did that, but I wanted something that was standalone, you know. And so I played a little bit with Arduinos. Um, I think they're pretty cool, uh, but it takes a lot of programming for an Arduino. Um, so I came across layout command control. These are standalone nodes. They don't need a computer to run. They, can, they contain logics. If you ever have heard of like a microprocessor or microcontroller, these are, if you can think of it that way, it's like a little microcontroller. Uh, but they do talk to each other. Anyway, I'll get into it here. So tell me a little bit more about LCC or DCC. Okay, well, everyone knows what DCC is, but let's just talk about it real quick. Digital carrier control or digital command control. It puts digital control information on the rails themselves. It's actually on the train tracks itself. And that's fine, that's really cool. It came out in the late or early 90s and then really took off in the 2000s. Everybody knows about this. Um, it's, it has a neat idea because you can have a lot of different locomotives. You can have lots of different things going on the same track. And basically because you've got data out there, um, you can run different things. So besides the locomotives, you can actually run trains as well, uh, as well as run stationary items, stationary decoders. So you like your turnouts and things like that can be controlled with it. And it actually works pretty well, um, but it does have some limitations. So let's talk about that. Um, first of all, DCC is one directional, right? So you got your command station, you've got your throttles or whatever your controllers are. And from that command station, it sends out commands onto the tracks. And so your trains respond to that. They really don't have a way of feeding back to the controller. Uh, you just simply have one direction communication. The other thing is because these trains are rolling, they're metal wheels on metal track, you've got little sparks, you've got a lot of radio noise. Um, so there, there's this issue of noise going on all, all the time. And I got a picture here of it. It's kind of an analogy. Um, if, you, if you think about a, a crowded train station, you, you've got an announcement saying, all right, train arriving on track four, and you got a bunch of people around you, well, they need to repeat that signal several times so that they make sure everybody has heard the signal or the command or the, the information. Same thing with DCC. The way that um, reliability comes in DCC is actually that command station keeps repeating signals over and over um, so that it makes sure that everything on that network has the information it needs to do what it needs to do. Uh, the data rate is around 8,000 bits per second. That's um, by today's standard, pretty slow. Um, if you have to say, you know, theoretically up to 10,000 addresses, you can do the math. And by the time you add sound decoders and things like that, um, things can start lagging down. So who cares? What's the big deal? So layout command control, the whole idea, the big idea here on layout command control is that you set up another network. You run a network for just running your accessories, your, your track detection, your turnouts, your signals, turn behaviors, crossing gates, whatever, even train room lighting. Um, I got a picture there of a highway. So you got one highway that just focused now on running the, the trains, the engines. You got another highway that takes care of all the other accessories that you got going on your layout. And by the way, LCC is agnostic to whatever kind of a uh, railroad system you have. It could be DCC, DC, AC, DCS. It really does not matter. It runs independently. Make sense? <clears throat> all right. And you say, well, so what, Kerpanic? That's uh, something that's like that's been solved many times over. 
Um, there's other options out there, and that's true. Uh, some of the popular ones are called LocoNet and ExpressNet and CMRI, and I'll go through each of those. So LocoNet is probably the most popular, at least in the U.S. It's, uh, it is a product of Digitrax initially, and I believe now they've um, opened it up. I, I am not sure if it's proprietary licensing or not, but there are other companies that make components for LocoNet. Um, peer to peer, and I'm going to get into that a little bit, means that the components can talk to each other back and forth, and that's fine, but it is relatively slow. So it's, it's popular, it's out there, um, but it is, it, it is uh, one of the technologies available. ExpressNet, it's more in Europe. Um, for those of you who are industrial control folks, uh, you, you recognize the RS-485 protocol. That's what ExpressNet is uh, operating on. And I'm not really familiar with seeing, I haven't seen many of those in the US, I gotta say. And another popular one is the CMRI, uh, that's Bruce Chubb's system. And it's not so much a, a peer to peer, but it is a true master slave. You have to have a computer to run all your layout accessories and it runs through these interface points throughout the, the layout. So those are some of the different options. So why would you wanna to go to layout command control? All right, so Layout Command Control was developed as a true peer-to-peer -peer system uh, for controlling all the functions on your layout unrelated to the DCC. So peer-to-peer -peer means anything can talk to anything else on the layout. Um, it's independent. You don't need a computer for it, at least when it's operating. You do you probably want a computer to program it, but once you have it set up, any device can talk to any other device. It's also bi-directional, meaning any point can talk to any point in the system in both directions. Um, I mentioned it is separate from the DCC bus, but it can actually talk to DCC as well. I have a uh, MRC PA at home, Prodigy Advance, and with that, um, I, I do have an interface between LCC and the DCC network, and it, and it works just fine, so it can talk to it. Uh, the big plus here, though, is it is open architecture. This is something that's been developed by NMRA. It is license free. So other companies, any company can go out there, buy the architecture and uh, develop products for it. And it'll be 100% compatible. And by the way, when we're talking LCC here, sometimes you may heard, have heard something called open LCB. So open LCB and LCC are, well, LCC is the approved NMRA approved portion of open LCB. So think of it as open LCB is kind of the big overarching technology and LCC is what's been released for, uh, for people to, uh, to develop. Uh, but it, for practical purposes, they're really analogous. They're really the same thing. Okay, so what makes it so special compared to some of those other ones that I shared with you? Uh, it's a physical network and it's based on something called Control Area Network, CAN bus. And CAN bus, <laughs> you'll love this, actually comes out of the automotive industry. When you think about it, automotive industry, You've got 12 volts, you've got a high noise environment, you've got spark plugs, you've got static, you've got a lot of machinery running. Um, boy, that sounds an awful lot like a model railroad. So CAN found adoption in the automobile industry. If you ever use an OBD reader, you're basically reading a CAN bus, which is the same architecture as LCC. So it's noise tolerant, it's an industry standard, it's designed for 12 to 24 volts. It operates at 125 kilobits. Now keep in mind, we were talking about 8,000 before, and now we're at 125. Plus, it has a range of 1,000 foot on the, on the bus, on the main cable bus. So I'm not aware of too many layouts that break the 1,000 foot barrier, but if you ever have that, there are ways to jumper those. But for practical purposes, 1,000 feet is pretty good for 99.9% .9 of our layouts. Again, the devices communicate with each other. I think it's also worthwhile to note that LCC standard supports Wi-Fi and Ethernet. So the theory is, and I'll get into this in a minute, um, but they actually have unique addresses. So if you have a, a network, let's say your LCC network um, here in, I'm in Colorado and I wanna have somebody dispatch a layout out in New York through the Ethernet I could and Wi-Fi, I could connect the two together. They're gonna be completely compatible and you could tie the two together, pretty cool. Couple other points. Uh, I mentioned again the peer to peer point. Uh, part of the importance of that in LCC's architecture is that it has globally unique addressing. Like your computers all have a MAC address. 
Every node, every piece of equipment built to LCC specification has a unique address. What that means, guys, is if I plug in an LCC node into the network, um, it immediately is uniquely identified and, and there's no other one like it in the world. So um, you can just keep pl plugging them in. You don't have to sit there mess with addressing. And then each of the nodes actually self-describes. So once they connect onto the network, they actually describe to the rest of the network who they are and where they are in the network. Very, very cool stuff. All right. Moving along then. So how does it work? Okay, so the, the whole theory on LCC is this thing called an event. Any kind of an event is created, it's distributed or it's sent throughout the entire LCC network. So an event can be triggering two kinds of, or, or there's, there's two kinds of things associated with an event, a producer and a consumer of that event. So, and a producer would be any kind of a thing that's sending information into the network. So let's say you have a block detection, that's an event. The detector suddenly says, hey, I got a train here or a push button, somebody pushes a button on a control panel, that creates an event, it sends it out to everybody. The consumers, on the other hand, are always looking for an event. They're listening on the network 24-7, 365, and it looks for some sort of an event. So if a push button gets pushed, this event goes out, a consumer says, hey, that's my signal that I'm gonna turn, for instance, a turnout. I'm gonna throw a stall motor drive on, or I'm gonna turn on a signal lamp or I'm gonna lower a crossing gate or whatever. So the whole big idea here is that you've got these producers and the consumers. Now the neat thing is one or any producer can be used by one or any consumer. So here's an example, I got a Y on two sides of an aisle. I could put a push button out on either side of that aisle. When I push that push button to throw a turnout on the Y, I can have it create an event that will be consumed by the same device, that stall motor. So it doesn't matter which side of the aisle I'm on, I can push the button and it'll automatically respond by throwing the turnout where I, you know, in the past you might have to come up with some sort of a wiring scheme and you have to put like a little uh, logic in there or something like that. This is all built in to LCC. Does that make sense? Another example would be in yard throat logic. You can have a push button say, I wanna to go to track seven. And then when that, push button gets pushed, an event is produced, right? And it gets sent out and then turn out one says, oh, I recognize that event. I'm gonna go throw to normal, normal. And the next one says divert, divert. And the next one says normal. So a single push button can be consumed by several consumers, the turnouts to flip into the right position. Does that make sense? And again, keep this in mind that this is universal. You can bring this same event to something halfway across the room. You can bring it back into a PC if you want to do a, a CTC panel, whatever you want to do, they're universal. All right. Mentioned to you Arduinos. I don't want to program. That's actually a picture of me when I had to start programming the Arduino. But you know what? They already did all the hard work for us. Um, LCC is set up so that you actually more configure the nodes than you actually program the nodes. In other words, all the communications, all the configuration work, all the logic um, setup is already, is already pre-programmed into the firmware itself. What you do is you configure it. And I think the best analogy is, you know, when you buy a DCC locomotive, you don't actually program in all the logic to run the motor. You just simply program or configure the speed curves or your max speed. And then the logic gets taken care of inside the chip. And so in the same way, the LCC nodes are pre-configured so that they've got all the smarts to talk to each other and they know how to work the network thing. You just simply tell it what's the event, what's the producer, what's the consumer, what would you like to do? So you just assign the event a name. You can be numerical, can be text, can be convo, whatever you wanna do. Um, and then the name will be universally recognized throughout the LCC system. Again, I'll show a couple demos of that, but it really works out pretty nice. I put a note here, by the way, you do need to keep track of whatever you called it, because as you start working with this stuff, it's always a good idea to have a, um, 
um, kind of a protocol of how you want to name things. Um, you know, it's easy to think you'll remember um, two weeks later, you look at it and go, hmm, what was I doing here? So a little bit of tracking, or a little bit of uh, standardizing makes a big difference. Okay, moving along here. Um, I'm going to share some of the pieces of the LCC system. Now, just a quick disclaimer here. I don't work for RR circuits. I am not a manufacturer's rep. I'm just a person who has a layout and wanted to use LCC. So uh, the folks at RR circuits are producing probably the, the, the primary pieces of LCC equipment out there right now. I understand TCS is making an LCC based throttle as well as they're talking about some additional products. I have not personally used any of those. I'm not trying to make this like a sales thing for our, our circuits or anything else. Uh, but again, they're, they're probably the primary supplier of these products. So I'm just sharing some of their products because that's what I've been using. So anyway, this is kind of an overview. Um, there's, there's a power supply um, and I'll walk through each of these. The blue hose is the network cable. Um, there's an interface into your computer uh, through USB over here, but let me just go through each of these individual, individually. Um, this is the power bus terminator here. Uh, the, they call it the LCC PowerPoint. I think it's unique to take a look at this because it has the little wallboard thing and it actually powers all the other nodes. You don't have to run power to all your other devices. An LCC PowerPoint will actually power hmm, somewhere between six and eight of the different nodes. And, and then that's it. You don't even need to worry about feeding power to all your different nodes at that point. There's also this little green bug here. Um, LCC is a single string uh, network. So basically this is a terminator. So you start at the terminator, you go through your different nodes and then at the other end, guess what? There's another one of those terminators. So that's how basically you build your system. If you wanted to add on to it, you just take off the terminator and then you add another node and you put the terminator on the end of that. All right. <clears throat> Computer interface, it's about the size. For those of you who have ever used a Sprog, this thing's about the same size as a Sprog. It's just a little box that basically you plug in your CAN bus to, and on the other end has an ethernet port. And you just plug it into your laptop and it allows you to configure your nodes through the PC. The nodes themselves are where the brains live. So there's, these are, this one's called a tower LCC. We'll get into that in a minute. But there's two different node models that are being produced right now. But again, this is where the brains live of the uh, LCC system. Uses a standard ethernet cable, uh, Cat5 cable. You can make these up for yourself if you wanna have longer distances or custom fit, um, or else you can just buy them out of your favorite internet supply store. Digging into what a typical node looks like, uh, there's two models that are offered by RR circuits. There's the tower LCC and the signal LCC. And they're both about the same size. They're roughly, I don't know, a little bit smaller than a three by five card, say maybe two by four, something like that. Not very big at all. Uh, the tower LCC has six put input output lines. And I think this is really interesting to know. There's 16 input output lines. You can configure each of these points as either an input or an output. So for instance, if you had a control panel you wanted to build, you can configure them all as inputs, for instance, for all your push buttons. And again, if you had a staging yard, you could configure this output as, uh, for all 16 as all outputs to drive, say, stall motors. One of the things that uh, the folks at our circuits, our, our circuits found though, is that they ended up uh, finding people want to have a lot of signals on their layout. So it turns out that it's kind of expensive to do signals this way. So they developed this thing called a signal LCC. So it gives you eight IO lines, configurable input or output, and that's off this little header box right here, plus 16 signal lamps. So the, these little connectors here are all for signal LED. And these, these are for LEDs, LEDs. They have uh, current limiting resistors built into them already, ready to go. So this is a very cost-effective way to set up, for instance, a control point. You've got 16 lights you could use, plus your I.O. points for like push buttons and the uh, turnout itself. Make sense? All right. Now, how do we get the signals in and out of these boards? So they have some of these, what they call I.O. cards, input, output, 
cards. So for example, this is a, what they call their VOD8. It's a detection input card. This connector right here plugs right into either the tower or the signal LCC, and it gives you eight detection points. And you wire them out over to the connectors that are provided here. They use uh, CTs, current transformers, and you, and you can wire them right in, and I'll show you how to do that. And this gives you eight detection points. This particular board here, the middle one, has eight stall motors that it can drive. And the last one has eight single coil solenoid drivers for those who use solenoids to control turnouts. This interfaces the, the nodes with solenoids. So those are some examples. They actually have, uh, I think, close to a dozen different I.O. boards. These are probably the ones that I use most. That's why I'm sharing them. Uh, but there's other ones as well. All right. I don't get freaked out on the picture here, but this is how it would wire into the layout. So again, you have your, your layout command control system denoted by this blue cable showing how the nodes interconnect with each other. That's fine. And then you have these IO boards, the, the blue boards that are shown in the drawing. And then you just simply wire out to whether the fascia buttons or to these detectors, these current transformers or to your lights and signals or even to your switch motors. Um, I don't think people can probably see this very clearly because of the presentation format and all that, but really it's, it's a matter of just simply wiring your wiring back into each of these IO boards, and then you simply bring, bring that into your nodes. By doing that, it brings it into the LCC system, and once you have it there, it's pretty easy to configure. All right. Give you an example of how it looked on my layout. When I put this together, I had um, on the picture here up to the right, on the lower right, I have these PSX breakers. So that would feed these four power buses. And so what I did then is I figured, well, I got the power buses right here in the upper left part of this panel, I'll just start mounting the nodes. And that's where I put my detection boards. That's where I put my turnout drivers and so on. So it made it very easy to um, assemble. By the way, I got to give credit to a friend of mine for giving me the idea of mounting all this stuff on a portable board. I was able to put this all together right on a workbench. And then I just built a little tray for it underneath the layout. It was a whole lot less uh, brain damage than trying to uh, wire all this stuff hanging upside down. Oops. And then when it was all in, that's how it took a look once I got it energized, um, made for, in my opinion, pretty neat assembly. All right, I mentioned how easy it is to program, right? Because nobody likes to program. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about JMRI. I'm gonna assume most people are somewhat familiar with it. If not, uh, there's oodles and oodles of um, videos out there how to get JMRI to work. It actually is running off of Panel Pro. If you've ever used Panel Pro, it's a pretty neat tool. It lets you set up a control panel for your layout. It also happens to be the way to interface into, um, into LCC. So you basically open up your panel and, and like I say, we don't want to get into the details of it, but inside of there, they have a pull down menu that says open LCB. And it's also optionally uh, set up as a LCC. And you just click on configure nodes and boom, immediately it'll open up an, a, a, a network drawing or pull down of all your nodes on the system. And then you click on open configuration dialog and then to the right here, you can see what you get. And you can start adding your name, you start putting your node description. Remember how I said there were 16 lines? It says select input output lines, line one, two, three, four. And you, you just literally guys, you just start filling in the blanks. It's, it's so intuitive, it's so straightforward, and, and you just work from top of the node configuration dialog here to the bottom. You just start working through it. All right. One of the neat things is as you start adding information into your node, the data actually turns orange. And what that means is that the information hasn't yet been written up into the node itself. So you type it in, it'll turn orange, and then you have this little right button and you click on the right button and that actually uploads it. I'll show it to you uh, in, a, in a demo here. Um, I'm, I'm really, I don't know if we wanna spend a whole lot of time going through these screens, but I'm just trying to show that it's, it's pretty 
you know, you start going line one, line two, line three, line four, and here's your different events, consumer events, producer commands, and you start working through it. You just simply start filling out the form and it actually just audit documents it. It just starts going through and, and starts doing its thing. All right. So moving past the, the screenshots there, a couple implications that I wanted to share with people. Layout command control, the slick implications. Again, you can program all this stuff into your nodes, configure them, use the right word there. Without your PC, you don't need your PC on to run. So all your logic, all your signals, all your staging art stuff works without your PC on. Um, you can do multiple control points for specific functions, like I gave the example of the Y. And here's another one that's kind of neat uh, that layout command controls offers, economy of communication, local decoding of a command, because you don't really need to have this information going through a computer, for instance, like to set up a control point, lower right-hand corner here, it's looking at all this information, like the turnout is straight or diverging, and is the main free or is the main occupied, is the siding free or is the siding occupied, and so on. And then the actual logic inside of the node does all the decoding for you. And then the signals will respond accordingly. So you don't really need to have all this information cruising back and forth over the network. It figures it out locally. What this means is you can actually set up a control point with all the signals, before you have the rest of your signal system up, you can have it just stand alone and it might just function just fine for whatever purpose you might need. Maybe you just want to do a junction. Anyway, it's kind of one of the cool implications. So tying it all together, um, I keep mentioning control point. I always think this is a really cool picture because to me, that's the essence of model routing. You have these cool meets and you get to see the signals change and turnouts throw. So that's the fun thing in my book. Anyway, with that, that's the end of the presentation part. Um, can I share my, let me see if I can still share my desktop. And what I'd like to do is uh, demonstrate how you can actually communicate. Um, share, I gotta find the right screen here. Is it letting, okay, maybe I can, um, not sure why it's not seeing, I can't, should I, be, I should be able to share a screen, Mike, right? Yeah. So are you guys seeing that? No, oh, so are you seeing just the desktop right now? Hmm, okay. So are you seeing, I don't know, I don't know if this is gonna work here. Let me, let me try it. Shoot, sharing, I should be able to show. I don't want to just share, because it's going to open multiple windows. If I just show one window, I don't know why it's not letting me um, share just the screen itself. Well, darn. Well, how about if I do this? Can I? Go back to just showing my screen here or my myself. Okay, all right. What I'm gonna do is go ahead and just share with you my uh, test layout, the demo layout. And hopefully everybody can see that.
So basically, we have our nodes here. And, um, man, what? This is not, we must have more technical issues today than I've ever experienced. Why is this signal not? Something's not right. There we go, okay. All right, so basically we have a power supply here. Um, I'm feeding this with a uh, Prodigy Advance. We've got a couple uh, leads going onto the tracks. Basically, I've got four blocks set up here, one, two, the junction itself, and then after the junction, four. So that's four blocks. I've got a turnout, a stall motor driver, and then here's our node. This is where the brains are. I mentioned also um, right here is this IO card. This is where you can have all the information come in and out. I've got a couple different things tied into it. Specifically, I've got a push button that lets me throw the turnout. You can see the turnout there. We have a, uh, the turnout itself is also driven through the IO board. And I've got all these little track detectors right here. And I don't know if you can see these, but these are CT coils, current transformers. And basically they come straight in without any kind of special signal conditioning right into the IO board for the LCC system. On the output side, I've got a ribbon cable here going to these cables. So if I switch, you can see that I've got the logic set up. Whoops, I should hold that up. Got the logic set up there, so it switches um, uh, the, the indication. And if I have some sort of a detection, you can see that the signals drop down to red based on that. So it really behaves independently. Notice that there's nothing connected to this system. It's all by itself. Um, it, it's, it's running on a standalone mode. And um, I don't know, it's, it's, it's pretty darn slick. Any questions while I'm demonstrating this stuff here, while I've got uh, the pieces laid out? All right. If not, I will um, try one more time, if you'll bear with me and see if I can get this panel pro to work. Um, uh, you know what I might do is, I'm just gonna go configuring a node and let's see, I can just share at least that node. Yeah, unfortunately, since it's working inside of a window, inside of a window, I don't know if it'll show up. Darn it. There it is. All right. So right here, we've got the node itself. And if I open up configuration dialog, I'm gonna go ahead and now switch. All right, I'm gonna go turn, stop sharing. This is gonna be a little clunky guys, but it'll let me do it one step at a time when I click on that. There we go. This is what the configuration dialog looks like inside of this. So you can see inside of here, I've got uh, line one is not used, line two is the occupancy detector right normal, turnout one, and so on and so forth. Scrolling on down, here's the consumer commands, here's the producer commands, depending on what I wanna do with each of those signals. I can have up to six events linked to any kind of a consumer event. I can have up to six events producing any kind of, you know, if there's something that's producing an event. Down here is where all the logic lives. And you just simply point and click and you go through each of these. This is uh, the signal uh, normal clear. And here's the logic as it builds up for the uh, that particular indication. And again, I don't wanna to spend too much time scrolling through here, but just to show how powerful this is um, you have then each of the masts. I have four or three masts on this demo layout. You have all these really cool features. You can have lamp fade. You can make it like an incandescent light or an LED light. 
How cool is that? You can have up to eight different rules associated with each mast. So a rule would be like stop, proceed, proceed cautious, so on. And if you actually have a more complicated mast, you can cascade these together and you could then of course have 16 rules or so on. Then you get down to the individual lamps themselves. Check this out. You got lamp two, one, two, three, four for this particular head. And you can set up what kind of uh, options you want. You can have it steady, you can have it slow flashing, medium, fast flash, flashing, or on a B cycle. So you could have it alternating back and forth. Pretty neat. And if that's not all, you go down here and you can actually set individual lamp intensities because of the LEDs being different sensitivities. Um, you can actually adjust by writing different values in here, the brightness of each of the LEDs, depending on what you want. So that's kind of a quick tour. Um, I just wanted to do a little bit of that demonstration there so you guys could see what it looked like inside the configuration dialog. But that's, that's what I had, guys. Um, is there any other question or are there any... Um, any comments? I think you're on mute, Mike. Okay. Yeah, kind of went faster through there. Traditionally, this uh, clinic goes a lot longer, but it's <laughs> without the actual interaction, it's a little bit harder. Yeah. Okay. Well, really, that's all I had for today, uh, Mike. Is there, uh, I guess I gave you back 20 minutes of your day here, but <laughs> I don't know if that messes you up or not. All right. Yeah, and you know, you bring up a good point there, uh, Mike. You know, sometimes people I get a little, you know, nervous about diving into this without having other people input. So there is a uh, layout command control groups IO. If you're familiar with groups IO, you can look up uh, layout command control, and they have a very active group there, and they include developers and users and so on. So if people are interested in taking the plunge. Uh, get logged in on that, and there's plenty of people that can do some hand-holding. They'll Skype with you, they'll Teams with you, whatever, and walk you through some of these different steps, so it's uh, it's not so scary. I guess I got a question I can ask then. Okay, so other than the command node, what else would you need to say set up a turnout control and signal controls? Yeah, so that... Uh, that node that I showed you actually had, you know, the node itself, and then they have one of the I/O cards is called a BOD4CP. Fancy way of saying it's a basic occupancy detector for four points. Plus, it also has two turnout, I believe, two turnout outputs. Plus, it has two push button input options. So, you know, on that single board, you could have that plugged into your node. And you've got all your I.O. you need for a control point. So, okay. all right, cost, what does it cost? Your starter kit for the PowerPoint and things like that is right around 100 bucks. Um, the nodes are running around 70 or so. And then the I.O. boards are in the $30, $35 range. So it's a bit of an investment, but if you compare that to like an SEHC or whatever, you're probably not looking that much different, frankly. 
Uh, most people have the laptop or a computer that they can do the programming with. All the software is free, so it's not like you're paying much at, you know, beyond that. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. You bet. All right. Give it back to you, Mike. 